Marriages are important. In fact, one of the reasons that propelled our school of marriage, because some people come to me, bah, 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 I say I don't have time. You see, as I mean, just like this, I'll be doing a mini session with you. I have people I trust, I'll be sending you to go for a session. If you really want my help, that's why I tell them, join the school of marriage. We teach, we teach 11 classes for the year. We run through different things. What am I saying to them? I'm saying sometimes people need to be in a community where issues are addressed, not to one person, but to bring a body of knowledge. So the husband may not even know. So imagine after much commendation, you come to the point where you're like, but I would really wish you slowed down a bit and touch me some more. You have not said it is not satisfying you. You are just putting a wish on the table or something else you can do. And guess what? Sometimes what you desperately want, he has done before, but is not used to doing severally. An average man, when you tell him a particular thing worked, he will overdose you with it. So you can refer to a particular time that, eh, that day you did so, so, and so. You finished me. Did you see how I was embarrassing my family? For a man, you have helped his ego to say, ah, okay, if I touch her like this, you have not condemned him, you have not tried to attack him, you have just pointed him to something that scattered your dada. So trust the Lord, James 1, 5, for specific wisdom, but generally commend more than find the right avenues to give the observations or corrections or anything. He will take it better. And to add this, to add to this, if you've not had, have, if, if you don't have the culture of talking about your sex life, please do. If you don't have the culture of talking about your sex life, you have to start because that would allow your spouse even the vulnerability to open up to you and tell you, okay, can we do it like this? Can we do it like this? You know, he was telling people about uh, how we discuss where was better, as in, you know, things like that. Why we do that is we can, doing that allows us to have feedback of how we are doing so far. And I can tell you, if you are, if you are... Lead to conversation, um, because one of the things you don't want to do... Okay, there's a code there. If you've got scriptures, yeah, um, you can look at 1 Corinthians 7, verse 6, if you have the message translation better. Um, the Bible says that Satan has an ingenious way of tempting us when we least expect. An averagely healthy sexual man, June to March, you have him in trouble. You don't want him getting into unfortunate situations or picking up habits that are bad to get by sexually. Um, it's not a normal thing to just get by. It's not. Uh, you want to sit back and have conversations. What trauma are you dealing with? What exactly changed? The reverse was the case for us, actually. Our sex life wasn't great. She was quite... I mean, we had a disastrous honeymoon. The truth is... I was an equa girl. I was uptight. Just wait. Yes. Wait. Let me confess. A <laughs> honeymoon was disaster by my standard. I was waiting to grill fish and eat well. Then I had this pain on my ankle after the wedding. We went to Budu. And she wanted all the adventure. She was this new bride ready to just have life happen. We will climb mountain. I'm climbing mountain. My leg is bending me. I'll come back to the room. No hope. <laughs> or we we'll just try and try. We we'll just do small. I thought we we'll just, you know. But see the funny thing that happened because you know your bodies react differently. So we had our baby. She had natural birth, but she had a little tear. Our friend, who's now a consultant, was like, you know, check and all. Oh, she's fine. She will be fine. Ha -ha. Two weeks into a childbirth, Hunter became haunted. I said, did they break something in this woman? So I asked, I called my that our friend. I said, is it safe? She said, she's your wife. Look at it. If it's safe, you won't. <laughs> huh? Two weeks after childbirth, the equation turned. Do yeah. <laughs> you get what I mean? Now, that's not something you are controlling. Mm. Something is going on with your body. Yeah. All right? So rather than allow it linger, if you have to seek professional help, get it. That's the honest truth. It's not something we can even fully answer here. You may have to see a therapist. What exactly happened with me? Do you get what I mean? So that couple need to, as a matter of urgency, I'm telling you, because the truth is, amongst us believers, 
if we go and fall, see, sexual sin is the hardest thing to confess. I'm not saying your husband has done anything. I, I'm counseling a couple that the last time they had sex was February 2019. Yes. There, there are stories we have heard that doesn't make sense. The guy hasn't gone anywhere, but man's situation is getting terrible. You get what I mean? So as a matter of urgency, sit together as a couple and seek help so that you don't give Satan a room to occupy your house. Something changed in your body and very often when something is going on with you through therapy, especially medical therapy when it's a medical case, they'll find a way to help you. But because we're in the house of the Lord, we speak grace in the name of Jesus. Amen. And we command you, Satan, take your hands off that marriage Amen. in the name Amen. of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And I just want to add for the benefit of the ladies here and also the husbands. You know, when a woman's uh, body goes through childbirth, it undergoes a lot of changes. And sometimes when you have a natural, like, a natural birth, uh, down there the area, the shape, what be the... Uh, the state of the place changes. And sometimes you may be suffering from vulnerability of, you know, whether you are still desirable, whether you are still wanted, you know. Please, husbands, beyond childbirth, let your wives know that you still love them, that you still desire them, irrespective of the changes that they have gone through. In fact, especially in the vaginal area, you know, when you have natural birth, there are things to do to strengthen the place, to make it firm again. But I can tell you initially, it may not be as it should be. Please don't discourage your wife because beyond that discouragement it can affect your, your sexual life down the line. Okay, thank you so much, Ma. Thank you, sir. I will take these three questions together. It's still on sex. All right, so the first one says... <laughs> Are we tired? <laughs> okay, I, I think they are happy. <laughs> All right, so the first one said, I've been married for over a year now, but haven't consummated my marriage. We found a way of satisfying ourselves. I visited the hospital, used lubes, and, but still not yet consummated. What can I do? That's the first one. The second one says, my husband and chatting, now five and six. Okay, it's not the same couple, yeah? No, not the same. Then let's take the first one. Okay, sir. First of all, they took the first bold step by actually seeking medical help, which is necessary. Uh, sometimes when medical is done, what you are dealing with is mental. I'll give you an example. Very uncomfortable example. In fact, the couple I talked about, 2019, February. The husband was given some medications and the medication makes him actually very erect. He had to discard them twice. But when the wife comes in counseling, because I've not been able to manage to see them together, I'm struggling to get them together, she's making sure it's not happening. When you listen to her, when she's done talking of her husband, you will think he's the devil. When I confronted him, he said, why won't he throw it away? How do I take a pill that keeps me erect for four hours and I'm going to walk? But as at this point, she has a mental block. She doesn't even want me to come near her. How do I continue to take the pill? What solution are we finding? So now, part of her problem was that offense took root. She's currently irritated. Other issues came up while they were trying to deal with that sexual part. I'm not saying that's the case of this. I'm just giving you an example of what a mental block is. You know, Women know this thing very well. When it appears this man that you might come to is irritating to me. Because the woman approaches sex first from the emotional perspective. The man approaches sex usually from the food perspective. That's why the prostitution industry is as booming as it is. The truth is, I'll give you an example statistically. The way you deal with IDP camps in Nigeria, if I'm not even up to, prostitution is at a pandemic rate in Europe. Prostitution is, is an industry that if they pull it out of the economy of the West, the economy of the West will shake. Why? A man very often in his beastly nature, if he doesn't lay it aside by Christ, can come into a woman he has no feelings for. 
you get satisfied and go. But the woman approaches this, except she's selling her body from a purely emotional perspective. She's hooked on to this. She likes this person, wants this person, and all of that. So, that mental block became the next problem of that marriage. So, I'm trying to counsel through a lot of things. Men see defenses. Walls everywhere. Alright? So, for this couple, pain can be a mental block. Fear of failing again can be a mental block. These are blocks that when they cross... I know a couple, for instance. Two. Let me give two examples. Because I want to tell some people going through such things in this house, you are not hopeless. We have a friend. They went, they were struggling. Both of them married virgins, like most people in this situation are. Not a bad thing. Struggle, struggle, struggle. After I did counseling, 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 guess what? How did I know that the door has opened? Later on, I saw the wife pregnant. I said, you put met me a problem. When solution came, you did not come back. So come and tell me you have one solution. Two couples like that in my life, that thing happened. I said, bro, Abba, now be, be kind to counselor. When there was a problem, we were talking. I didn't know that you opened up finally. But all of them, mental block entered. So if medically, they have given you all the solution left, it's now time to move in faith. And we're discussing, my wife and I are discussing after this morning session. One scripture that hit us when we found it, that would have mentioned this morning, let me mention it. See, when I prayed earlier, Please take it seriously. She Abraham could not conceive. She Romans 4 tells us that it took the power of God for him. Mm. Do you know when Sarah died, Abraham married Keturah and had six sons. Yes. The miracle was so potent he could not stop. Abraham knocked for 30 something years after Sarah's death. Go and check um, Rev Genesis 21. Keturah was married by Abraham after Sarah's death and has six sons. Six. A man whose body was dead until miracle happened. So you see, you see all these things? When the hand of the Lord with all the other things we are saying touch you. <laughs> it is well. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Um, so let me just go ahead with the second question. It says, my husband and chatting, now five and six. He loves chatting compared to gisting. I have never known the joy of gisting with my partner. We don't even romance before sex. What do I do, please? I hope he's here, he's getting lessons. But if that chatting is with you, see, uh, sometimes you find solution by starting where your partner is. If your partner can engage you, engage him. Start there. Because you see, sometimes we hold on to what we want. We don't even go to find the other person where they are. Do you get what I mean? See, I hope you guys can handle the truth. My wife has never had great phone habits. I am still battling. Now me, they charge a phone. Even though my wife can be watching a salmon on 3%. Then the phone dies. Ah, I thought I plugged it. Let me tell you, this afternoon, my wife had her phone plugged for so long. I went to the phone to help her do something, as I do. I post and tag her. I go and accept the tag, me. <laughs> so if you send my wife a message, you're angry, I will see your anger. Even her husband of 13 plus years is still dealing with it. So I picked the phone. Baby, why is your phone still on 11%? I plugged it now. I looked at the wall. It's plugged, but not on. <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying? But there was a point I had to call her. Let me tell you the kind of person I am. I see the hot, nine Gs, they sweep me past. So I may be on a journey and something happens. The person I want to talk to is my spouse. I send a message. My wife, ah, I will come home. I say, I sent you a message in the morning. Please answer me. Are you getting my kind of problem? So, if you, you see, your affliction is common to all. You are not getting everything you want. But here's the deal. <laughs> oh, God. You see, I said, I'm not, am I lying? Yeah, so it's not, it's not news. But here's the deal. She's growing in strength in that area. But sometimes you have to give very straight communication. There's a time I called her from the office and I told her, let me not lie to you. If you know how many girls ask or attempt to ask me in a day, sir, how are you? Have you eaten? Are you okay? You just sit up. You will just sit up. I'm telling you. Because how can I be fighting Goliath and I'm fighting? You understand what I'm saying? I mean, they're not, they're not looking for sex. They just reach out. Sir, how are you today? Have you eaten? 
Is you understand? So I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's not lie. You. Communication is very important to this man. Because I will pick phone, try to send message. Before, but guess what? When the reverse is the case, she's not even done saying hi, I say hello. So sometimes I just remind her, are you not seeing the way it's within you? Of course, you know the responsibilities that come. So start where your partner is. Do the best to get into that space. One of the ways you would uncover this problem, if he's not engaging you, try to engage him. You will see whether he wants you to come at him in that way or it's an addiction of flirting. There are two different things. Because somebody giving to the addiction of flirting will enjoy to chat every other person. But when their spouse chats, I'm busy. Work is pressuring me. But that same person, hi from another girl. Hi, how are you doing? Do you get what I mean? To attempt to engage him in his preference. To see if you can become the person on the other side of the divide. The gist will come. Why am I saying this? Dare to show you at home and on your phone. Pick up your own phone. Start chatting him in the same room. You could think it's a joke. Start it. Like the way I'm looking at you is like I'll devour you tonight. <laughs> An average man, even if his village people are on him, they will leave him that minute. You offer a man sex. Something starts shifting. See the way I'm looking at you. <laughs> I've never seen you this cute. I feel like eating you up. Is it not conversation? It's conversation. And guess what? If you truly get him there, if he doesn't have a flirtatious problem, his mouth will start opening gradually. God, there are certain conversations if you are having, before you know it, it will excite you enough to start talking. Yeah. Because some of the people you are dealing with, sorry I'm taking time on this because it's a layer thing. Some of the people you are dealing with, the problem did not start with you. You just inherited a problem that is 30 years old. They have not been talking. Nobody has ever engaged them. They have never been into conversation. Some people were raised in homes like that. So you are going to help him start from where he is, then help him break something that is older than your relationship. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'm going to just merge these two questions, and this happens to be from men. How should a spouse make up for a postponed sex, especially when a woman, after she's turned you down over being tired or ill, seeing that they even hardly initiate it? The next person says, my wife hardly, in fact, never initiates sex. I hardly get any signal to say I need you. It never comes. I always do and I get torn down and it hurts me. My brother, I feel your pain. I was there. It hurt a lot. But I found the answer and I began to engage the answer. An average African woman is too burdened to think about sex. It amazes me every time we travel to other parts of the world how different culture is. I meet some friends and hosts who have favorite restaurants. Your wife does not have. She's the favorite cook. You meet some friends and hosts who tell you this is where we have our best fish this is where we have our best pizza. This is where we have our these. You meet certain cultures that, of course, even through movies have mentored us to a degree who the women are not burdened at all when it comes to domestic life. Let me tell you something going on in our home. We currently do not have a help. So even the three children that came with us, they're right now in their room. We're monitoring the situation. We have a phone with them. We go back. We've spent some time with them today before we got back here. I mean, um, we did that from the last five years to sometime three years plus ago, or like two years plus ago, then we had a help who visits and goes. The help is out again, so we are back to just us. One of the things I uncovered in that period is how much a woman is burdened. You are not done eating breakfast when a woman is thinking of lunch. You are not done eating lunch, a woman is thinking of dinner. And Africans understand three square meal when three is not a square. But you know, we have this demand on the woman. Seated in this room, the likelihood of who does school runs in your house is your wife. The person who caters for the home. Some men are barely in the house when they're already complaining how dirty the house is. So the woman is so burdened, she doesn't have time to have an emotion. So she's so full of responsibility. All these things are talking naked. She's wondering what they're talking about. So one of the things I tell men to do, and here's the deal. 
one of the first things a man needs to exclude from his life to touch the emotion of his wife is to exclude every activity that is not a necessity because you see a man do things he can keep aside for later you see him drawn into it and failing to help let me tell you the truth I can compete in a competition in this room for men that are busy and I am likely to win against a lot of people in this room if I can be domestic then I challenge you wake up to it you will mop you will clean take one week and enter the things your wife does you will be shocked how much she will enter you just go into her life and depressurize it that's why like what Baba was saying well, he's only receiving instruction for Holy Ghost. Me, I just thought about it. It makes sense. Just take a... See, you see this trip and trips like this or the one we go as vacation. Oh, God. My wife is in holiday the moment she's not putting pot on fire. My wife is in holiday the moment she's not doing school runs. No matter how busy that other life is, just don't put pot on fire, don't do school runs. She's already in a different mode. So, you see... You need to understand the pressure that is taking your wife away from emotions and depressurize it. And again, this is also in the reverse for a lot of people. Because economic pressure is the reason why you have men who just want to come and enter and come out. So a wife needs to also stand up to the place of speaking strength to her man. Because a lot of these things I'm saying, some men are just looking at me, who has time for romance? What is foreplay? Because the only thing he said is rent. After rent, school fees. People are celebrating Easter. Fathers are thinking of resumption. It's a very the equation is simple. So until you learn to help your partner depressurize, you cannot get into their emotion. Every other conversation about libido level or no libido level starts from here. So that because please don't even make a habit of demanding sex. That's why being turned down hurts you. Make a habit of initiating the process there are two different things because a lot of times especially men who speak this way you come to the bed with a sense of entitlement to have sex but if you initiate see it's in a sense luring or seducing getting somebody into a mode do you get what i mean for example it's not every time there's holiday sometimes it's a conversation you start in the daytime Talking about certain things, wooing them. Let me tell you the truth. Some wives seated here cannot remember when last their husband, outside a preacher, telling them to say it, said, I love you, you look beautiful, I love your body, or commended anything on them. That means you are not kicking her off sexually. Once a woman begins to feel used, you look like an enemy. So you need to break down those feelings that are in the negative of what you are looking for. That's how you initiate it. That's why an average woman, once she begins to listen to any man, whether the man is her husband or not, something kicks on her inside. Something automatically kicks. So it's so important to realize that I must do the best I can do to put her in a mood, to put her in a shape, to initiate the process and not come and demand to receive something from him. So to both of them, they need to make effort. Julia wants to say something. Ladies, please, don't be afraid to advance. Don't be afraid to approach your husband. Don't be afraid to initiate sex. Ask God for courage in your heart and strength. You know, you can pray about this. You can pray about sex. You can pray and ask God for strength. Because a lot of times you feel like, ah, am I sure I want to get into this? But please, don't be afraid to initiate sex. And... I want to sound the warning to the men so that they will not face disappointment and get discouraged. And also to the women. You see, if you, if you begin to assist your wife to unburden her of the things that are stressing her out, especially if you try to help with house chores. Now, don't expect too much initially. Don't expect too much because sometimes you feel, oh, she should have kissed your feet, you know, make outrageous, uh, uh, exciting sounds or tell you how much they appreciate your help. Sometimes she's so caught up in the fact that I do this every day. Like, this is my life. 
why are you complaining because you just wash dishes uh, today? Like, it's not a big deal. And uh, you get discouraged. And to the women, if you see your husband making effort, especially that we know that we are in this part of the world where uh, it's not always the in thing for a man to help out with house chores and things like that. If they are making attempts to help out, please appreciate them as in loud the clap very well, loud the appreciation so that they know that, oh, uh, uh, this is pleasing my wife. And I tell you something, if your husband is doing something good and you appreciate him over it, somewhere inside his brain, it is, it is captioned there, repeat this again and again. So if you want them to keep, you know, helping out, being positive, and doing the right things. Try to appreciate the little, uh, the, the much that they are trying to do. Thank you so much, man. And thank you, sir, too. It says, I've struggled with masturbation years before I married. And even in marriage, I can't get over it. Many times I fall into it, sometimes even immediately after sex with my wife. Help me, please. I'm so glad you're asking this question because what Satan wants to steal is actually sexual intimacy. Uh, the, the biggest thing masturbation steals in marriage is that it steals the capacity of your spouse to satisfy you. So you, you come to the point where you are giving them sex as a chore you do. Let them not be angry or just something because it's not up to the level. Now, first thing you do when it comes to certain habits, um, you have already even done some to be asking this question, is to be honest that you have a problem. And like we were saying earlier, this is a long-standing one. You've been doing it. Um, this is something you should be able to speak to your spouse about. Now, I know there will be a lot of fear as to how they will take it, how the reaction would be. But in this case, I think one of the places you need to deal with is to speak to your spouse. Uh, speak to your spouse from the perspective of the fact that there are a strength partner to you. How are they going to be strength to you? You may feel bad like they may take it in a certain way. All right? Um, if you keep keeping this, the chances are that you are not going to deal with this. If you don't want to start with your partner and you do have um, you know, the right spiritual authority over you that you can first speak to. You need, see, when a weakness comes to the point where we cannot deal with it, that's where we begin to go to the next level of dealing with issues by meeting someone else, all right, who can stand with us, first of all, in prayer. Number two, to be an accountability partner. Because this person is able to ask you how far with that area? And speaking like this, I also have to say this. See, some things in life can offend you, but you will take certain decisions because there's also a trust of heaven that you should be a help in that situation. Because it takes boldness to call out an error I'm in and even open up about it. So the person may be your spouse, but he's seeking help. Because the truth is, until that stream is stopped, this person may actually never get into full intimacy with you. And this did not begin with you. Satan planted this even before they met you. So it's a scheme of hell to perpetuate an issue. Alright? Now, besides these two, we very often undermine the power of human decision. When it comes to salvation, your decision is required. Yes, the Holy Spirit moves on your heart, but you've got to take the step. With the heart, man believes. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. You must get enablers of your will to strengthen your will. For instance, I tell people, read the most, listen the most in your own area of challenge. But what we do most times is that we stay away. There are materials you need to pick. This person should be picking everything on consecration, personal devotion, growth, everything that deals with sin in a man's life. Why am I saying this and why am I connecting it to will? 
The Bible says we should lay aside every sin that easily besets us. You will not tell somebody to lay aside what they cannot lay aside. That means I have the capacity to pick it, I have the capacity to drop it. But guess what? We often don't strengthen our will. That's why we fear to read or listen in the area we are challenged. Because our first impression in the flesh is they will come and condemn me. I know what they will say. Masturbation is a sin and so what? But the Bible says you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That means I must carry my weakness and hand it over to truth. Listen to it repeatedly. There are messages I put on. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to give pillars to my decision when it comes to my area of weakness. So I put it on and listen and listen and listen and listen. So that conviction can go deeper. Alright? And the law of displacement now takes its course there. If you put a glass of water in this room, science tells you, experiment tells you, if the glass is full and you draw, drop a piece of stone in it, it will displace some water. If you weigh the stone against the weight of the water it displaces, they'll weigh the same. So, am I putting enough into the weakness that will displace the water in the cup or in the glass so that the new thing I put in is what occupies the space? So, it's, see, you need to get radical. The way somebody is giving a wicked pro prognosis or diagnosis from the hospital, they take a radical course of treatment. It's the same way we need to look at sin and say, this is cancer. It wants to come from my destiny. What will somebody do if they have a diagnosis? They will go for any and everything they can afford. So I need to sit down, not to just call out the sin, but to take every step from the Bible and to every word God has released that can enable me be strengthened in that area. So this person needs to take radical steps, very radical steps. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, you... Just two things I want to add to that. Uh, for us to overcome temptation, you know the Bible tells us to watch and pray so that we do not fall into temptation. Part of the ways that you can strengthen yourself so that you, you, you are not susceptible to this temptation is to stay in the word and to stay in prayer. If you keep these two things uh, as an intentionally abreast, you find out that uh, the, 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 the excitement of that sin weighs because the, the word of God and prayer takes over this, uh, uh, the interest of your heart. So you find out that uh, the, 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 the attraction you have towards that sin went away and you are wondering, like, these are the things that easily got me down before. But because you, are, you, you stay in the place of prayer, you stay where you are, like my husband said, filling up yourself with the word you keep seeing that big. Okay, thank you so much, Ma. Thank you, sir. Um, I will just ask this question. This one, you've answered part of it, um, but there is a second part to the question. And um, I'm merging two of them because they are the same, um, the same shade. Uh, it said, hobby will be in the mood, but his addiction to phone would not allow him. Until when I'm fast asleep, then he will come touching if I deny him, am I wrong? And then the completion of it. This is another one, but I think they are in the same line too. I get easily turned on with words before sex. But my husband isn't good at it. What can I do to help me, please? Thank you. Um... All right, so um, the, the first one, yeah? There are, there are ways you uh, approach issues that are more effective than other ways. <clears throat> you know, there are certain times where denying when he comes later, you may win the battle but lose the war. You don't want to lose your spouse. It's okay sometimes to turn to him, both family and playfully. As I'm waiting for you now, you're punching phone. If you come later, I will not answer you. Do you get what just happened? Because sometimes the problem is, you are so trained not to show a man you also want. That you watch him do it till the end. Then you are bitter going to bed. 
That's your husband. See, the Bible says do not defraud one another in this matter. I was somewhere preaching and I told them, let them amend Nigeria constitution. Let EFCC get involved in this matter. Their economic and financial crimes commission. They should add sex, economic, financial, and sexual fraud because the Bible says, "Do not defraud." Fraud. You know, see, you look at your spouse and say, "I'm entitled to your body." Look at them. Yeah, I know you are. You say, "I'm entitled." <laughs> Only the ladies now look at your husband and say, "I can want you, and it's fine." Say you belong to me. In fact, let's put it this way. Say I own you. I own you. Now you get them. So I don't know where you're carrying that shame, shy. No. Say uncle. You know, turn two times. I know some people. I will not tell you the people. I know one couple. I know them very well. When the wife lies down naked on the bed. I know the couple very well. When the wife lies down naked on the bed. It's a signal. She'll just be rolling. Then she now tell the husband, hope that door is locked. Let these children not come inside. I know the signal. I know the couple. I know a man. Glory to God. Why don't give a signal. Say this for you are punching. Don't come later. <laughs> it is well. So the next one is about words. Yes. Um, again, feedback is necessary. So you may want to start from the place where you establish, you help establish a system of general feedback. The reason why a lot of times our spouses cannot take feedback is that the entire feedback system is curated to come and tell them they are doing wrong. Do you get what I mean? So it's not like there's a general room for feedback. Like I said earlier, learn to start giving positive feedback to this very person. Do you get? Just start talking about other things. Then later, begin to push it in that you would like to hear them. All right? The truth is, more men are in this category than you can imagine. More men. I know the journey I've taken with maybe talk to me now. You know, sometimes they would even start talking, hoping you would. Rest. But the man is focused on business. Because this is serious business. We want to close this deal. You understand what I'm saying? So, but somehow, learn to pass the feedback without condemnation. Because that's where the problem would be. It's not the feedback that is the problem. All right? But why doing that? I've been missing to say this. Let's say it. You are never going to have it all. So there are times you may come to the point where you realize that a particular one will take time for it to happen. There are times you come to the place where you say, on this issue, I may lower expectation for now. Because, let me not come and sound like fairy tale. Long suffering is still a part of the Christian marriage. And suffering long while it is not suffering forever, it's quite long. And it can be long. So, cash in on the areas where it's going well. Do your best to give feedback in that area the best way possible. And hope for improvement. And like Julia added earlier, pray about it. It's a thing you want. And God would give you your heart desires. So, present it in prayer. I, I want to enjoy that level of intimacy. Alright? It's very important. Praise God. I want to appeal to the men. Please speak to your wives. Talk to your wives. Don't just talk anything, but speak lovingly to them. You know, the thing you are refusing to say at home, your wife can be hearing it every day in the office. So if she's dressing fine, comment. Tell her that she's looking fine. Tell her that she's beautiful. Tell her that she, she's, she's looking lovely. As in, for the men, your wives are wearing dinner gowns. They did their best to come out fine. Have you even commented and appreciated them for that effort? <laughs> because if I interview a number of wives here, they can't remember the last time their husbands looked into their eyes and told them, I love you. For a woman, it's important for her to know that you desire her. Women are moved by words more than by sight. And for the men, oftentimes it's the reverse. The man is looking at you. So wives, please, if you have not been making effort, please, can you dress fine? 
that man is going to work, going out every day, and he's seeing other women deck up with makeup, looking fine. I'm not saying go extreme with the makeup, but they are looking good. And every time he's at home, you're always tying wrapper on the chairs. You know, you're wearing the clothes you've worn for three days to be walking around the house and doing... The hair that you covered with wig, you open the remaining at home. Please try. Because what, what, uh, the way you present yourself, let it be pleasing to your man. Try, make efforts. Thank you so much, Sama. Um, the next set of questions are similar, um, so I'll just pick them for the sake of time. And so it says, how do I handle my husband's difficulty in apologizing now that we are married? It upsets me and turns me off since he wasn't like this before marriage. Another question in the same line says, how do I handle my husband's anger and property damage? Another person says, how do I address my husband's drinking habits? The problem with all three questions is that you want to address, handle, cure, correct, and deal with stuff that is not in your power to choose to change. Um, it's quite humbling to know that a lot of times over responsibility is a killer in marriage you are not responsible for those choices you can play a role to help them get to where they make the choices now let me tell you the honest truth that's why you take advantage of platforms like this see there are certain things you are not going to address by yourself i don't know about this forum but more women ensure their men attend our men-only program than men who stand up to attend by themselves. Mm -hmm. Because those women have found that any time they associate with this arrangement, they come back with a difference. Mm -hmm. So what I cannot fight frontally, that's why, you know, let's learn something from our brothers on the other side. Do you know what they do when they dump a child with a malam? They are putting that child for reset. So there are avenues God has given you while you are praying. Because the reason why certain things are not changing your home, you have confronted to the point where the person told you to the face, stop wasting your time. So what's the use of your confrontation? What's the use of your nagging? See, nagging has never fixed anything in the world. In fact, nagging simply turns the pressure the other way around. Because sometimes people sit with you in counseling. Because of what they have made the other person become, you cannot even see their fault. You just see only what the wife has become. Mm. She's nagging, she's quarreling, she's shouting, she's this. That's not where your solution is. While you are praying, begin to ask yourself, what can this man be plugged into that he can see differently? What forums can I take this person? What can I expose this person to? Then above all, what light am I showing? See, I don't want to get into preaching. One of the contemplations we had for this meeting, like I said this morning, was a conversation on how deep is your light. Because if darkness is always quenching our light and getting us to become darkness, what made Jesus say that if the light that is in you is darkness, how great is your darkness? See, I want to challenge you. All of us are going to come with baggage. All of us have come with baggages. Nobody came perfect, including you. So as this person is manifesting, we need to go back in the place of prayer, first of all. And prayer does three key things. Number one, it's in the place of prayer you go and collect grace for yourself. Because this long suffering has been commanded to suffer long. It's not easy on the flesh until grace is released. So I must go first of all in prayer to find grace. Lord, I know you will deal with this, but what if it takes three years? What if it takes five years? Because let me tell you this. Some problems are older than your relationship. They were carrying their problem before you came. And don't tell me you didn't see it. That means you are not discerning. Because there are two ways you see problems. By observation or by discernment. Somehow, somehow, you missed it. Whether you didn't observe well or you didn't discern well. We are now inside. So the first thing you need to go and seek in prayer is grace. Because a lot of times people also sit with you. And they sound like your counseling can bring automatic solution that day. I also don't lie to myself. There are people that when you are done talking to you. You know they just entered a process. They have not entered solution. 
Do you get what I mean? So you pray for grace for you. Number two, you begin to attack the root of the issue in prayer. Because for some people, they are dealing with trauma. Some people are dealing with pattern. Some people are dealing with weakness. No time to explain all of that. Pattern, trauma, weakness, they are different things entirely coming in different shapes. I'll give you one example, for example. There's what we call imprinting. What your exposure does to you without your knowing. Because informal education is stronger than formal education. You know, it's just like you put an Igbo child, born to Igbo parents, in the hands of a Hausa family from birth. They are Igbo by birth to their parents. And they cannot speak one word of it because they grew up in an environment that imprinted Hausa into their system. How do you deal with that? Do you just come suddenly and say, speak Igbo, speak Igbo, you must speak Igbo. You are wasting your time. They took time to imprint something. So intercession gets you to the point where you begin to pray God to raise a different system around this person. For some people, like one lady, one of her husband's closest friends died. Do you know what happened to the husband? The man, like every time, he doesn't come straight home. He and the boys, he and the boys. The man enters sobriety. Did I say God killed his friend? I don't know. But that guy's death then shook the husband. He started coming home early. He started reevaluating re life generally. Sense started hitting him to a degree on that matter. So intercession is actually imploring God to put roadblocks and systems that can start re-engineering the person. Then the third purpose of that prayer is like the example I just gave. I say I don't know if God killed the person. God will also start plucking out enabling systems for that madness. So confrontation is not always the answer. And sometimes God will even use you to be part of the enabling system. Bring him to a place like this. See, I have no doubt. Some men, courtesy of wives, have come into this place the last three days and some things will never remain the same. Why? They walked into a certain degree of grace, truth, and teaching. So trust God for systems, trust God for places. Sometimes, you know, you can go and buy a book and say, read. You will not go read them. I tell couples, both male and female, sometimes just just your partner. Wow, I've been reading this book, Jesus. The lessons I'm learning in this book. You are not just learning for you. By the time you mention one, two, but when you now say, you need this book. The husband will just look at you. I don't know who married who in this house. Whether it's me that married you or you that married me. Do you get? So be careful with confrontation. It is very often counterproductive. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you so much, sir. This question says, how does a wife handle an irresponsible husband who earns more, but still, but still after her finances, emptying her account, squandering her salaries, and even contributions? Um, everything I answered in the last question applies here but to add exceptions apply when you are dealing with a system that is broken for instance a few years ago I sat in counseling with a couple in Lagos I was going into minister in Lagos so I asked them to see me we were speaking online of the 22 years of that marriage 16 was a total waste. When this man walked into the room, I couldn't believe this is the man we have been talking about. You know when the Bible describes Saul, the king, as head and shoulder above every man in Israel, this guy's imposing figure, built, physique, made me a man, envy him. But an Efulefu walked into the room. I don't know what they call Efulefu in Plateau State. If we left with what my people call you a useless man. That kind of king that wakes up to drink and goes to bed and drink. His own was not drinking. Core irresponsibility. The wife earned more, unlike this case. The wife was setting up with business before that failed in his hands. The wife connected him to a major contract in her place of work that almost cost her a job because of his irresponsibility. 
And his entire problem, even then, is that his wife is refusing to set him up. And he has been waiting for 16 years. Wow. Yours sincerely, when I cornered the wife, one of those that are counseling session, I told her to start hiding money. Because her error up until that point was that she was declaring everything. You declare everything to a husband, not to an irresponsible man. And why did I tell her that? Straight up. That's where we don't want to make the mistake of allowing the world think that we just kill people. She was the one paying school fees. And his own, eh, he got so bad, his family got involved in the chopping. As you come, I got a raise. Who told you to say it? The two children were in school at that time that the school fees for the year was over six million. Wow. So I said, but then you want to kill yourself. Keep one account. A percentage goes, don't talk to him. If any day he comes about it, tell him proper plain, I have to pay school fees. I have to do it. I'm not buying gold. I'm carrying low. She's paying house rent. In fact, he was so reduced to the wife. He's the one that does all they go to the market. Because he had no job. Not 60 years. Not making effort to do any other thing. In this case also, he makes way more money. But he wants to run down the little you are contributing. And I counsel women sometimes. I am also not saying go and buy gold. If your contribution to the home is buying full stuff, before he sees money, let him see full stuff everywhere. Do you get what I mean? Put it to use in a way that if he talks, even the world will know he has a problem. Put it to direct use. Because some of those people, if some men take money from their wives, that person is born again. Some men take money from their wives to go and take care of other girls. He reached that level. So you put the money to use. By the time you do it two, three months, his eye will clear. Ah, you didn't get salary this month. Ah, I went to the market. You didn't get salary this month. Oh, the clothes I took for the children last month was due to pay. I paid. Put it into straight use. Let him not see cash. Because he has a cash problem. And the solution God gives cash problem in every marriage is to pay you with somebody who does not have a cash problem. But if the person is not responsible enough to sit with you, haven't taken note of all this, go back to the last point I made about intercession, about weakness and all of that. Confrontation won't fix this. He came with his problem. Okay. Um, thank you so much, son. This person said, is it okay for the wife to manage the husband's finances if she can be trusted with it? Yes. Is that a question? <laughs> manage you. Hey. Okay, so another person said, I got pregnant for my boyfriend and moved in with him. We've been living as husband and wife since then till now. Is it wrong? Are we to correct it? And then how? Uh -huh. Are you good with your reaction? <laughs> Congratulations. Now, person where no aborting baby, now get picking. Because of people now abort, they abort, they are picking. Mm -hmm. I, I, I encourage your boldness. The standard answer from scripture is actually obvious. The reason the apostles told them, you are actually married, let me tell you, but under a different system. The reason the apostles told them that if you are married to an unbeliever, do not leave, is because those guys were actually married as unbelievers before they found Christ. So maybe the wife got born again or the husband got born again. And they say, ah, my son is not born again. What did the apostle say? Where are you going to? Let me ask. Two of you have now found truth and you're asking this question. Whose wife did you give Belay and children? Who are you living here for? You come for counseling, we sit you down. We explain to you the purpose of marriage so that we bring you up to speed that this thing you have been cohabiting and doing in fact, which you have not done in righteousness. See the pathway to it. We run you through forgiveness. Lord, we see that we were wrong. But looking at us, coming to the truth, we still choose each other. Ah, who told you we must go and do a big wedding? We bring you to church on Sunday morning, we call you out. Because should I allow you to continue to live under another system 
who I should bring you to the system of life. We counsel you, we bring you forward, but here's the deal. Because truth is above convenience. If they found truth and cannot find purpose with each other, then that sin they have been committing will end the sin, end the relationship. Start talking about parenting rights and all. Because marriage is not also supposed to just be chosen for choosing sake. It is that in truth, we have found purpose. You get what I'm saying? So it's important to go and subject yourself to spiritual authority. Is a spiritual authority, like I said this morning, when Benihim and his wife went through divorce, they went through fresh counseling like singles. In fact, they were given the rule of abstinence. They kept away from each other like they were singles who have never been married. Went through counseling and were joined in holy matrimony for a second time. So the first step you take, go to the spiritual authority you should submit to. If you don't have a Bible-believing church already and somehow you ended up here, meet uh, uh, my purity or the leaders, open up that I'm the one that has the question. They will take you through spiritual guidance to make sure that you lay foundation if you are going to come into a Christian union. Because what you have right now is cohabitation under a different rule. Mm. All right? Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Um, there are so many wonderful questions, but we can't take all the questions tonight. So what we're going to do is we take the last three questions. And um, one of them says, um, I found out a while back my husband cheated on me. He denied at first, later confessed and apologized. But it is difficult to trust him again. Please help me. Trust is a journey. Let me speak from the male perspective or the offender. There is a path for the innocent one. The only thing I'll highlight about the innocent one, don't rush yourself, it's a journey. It's a big journey. You are going to need grace, I'll let Julia talk about that. To the offending party, trust is first donated by assumption. I assume I can trust you. Trust is sustained by action. Trust is lost by action. Trust is regained by patient action. Your sorry is not automatic ticket to being believed. Your sorry commences a long process. A process so long that even things you didn't offer in the past, you start offering now. You may not have been the type who gave every location you were. Do more to help your partner regain the trust. Because over time, your partner can come to the point where they so regain the trust, they forget you broke it at any other time. It's not the easiest, but you are going to do that without any sense of entitlement. You are going to do that as somebody needing to help the other person get somewhere. So if the offending party, for instance, is here, you need to know that your job is cut out. You have to be patient. You cannot demand trust. You re-earn it with buckets of action. If you are uh, always close, open up. If you are always mystic with your movement, make it easy. Be full of action that helps, all right? Yes, and for the, um, and for the spouse that, that was hot, I want you to understand that it's going to take a process. Your healing is not just going to come automatic because they apologized or because you found out. It is going to take a process. And one of the things uh, you need to do is go to God and ask him for grace to heal your heart. You will find out that um, a lot of times those uh, spouses that are hot uh, are going through uh, you know, the state where they find it difficult to even engage in sex with their partner because of the hurt they carry in their minds. I can tell you that it's not going to, your healing is not going to be automatic, but be patient with the journey. And while you are patient at, uh, at the journey, give grace to your spouse. Don't shut them out. Don't just, um, you know, suspend the marriage because you are feeling hot. You see, when you, when you expect the best out of somebody and they hurt you, yes, you are, you are hurt. 
but if you begin to put them down with your words you are just making it harder for them to um, to come out of where they have they have been because if I know that my spouse expects more from me my spouse is encouraging me to do better my spouse is you know believing that even though I failed I can do better you know I'm more encouraged to stand I'm more strengthened to stand through it and uh, you know that would give them grace to rise up from their fallen state and I want to tell you that uh, one of the things that the enemy will attack your mind with at, at, uh, is in the area of your thoughts the devil will come at your thoughts so that even the slightest things your spouse does you are already suspecting them you are literally paranoid you are, everything they do you are you are thinking you know the worst about them you will need to guard your heart the bible tells us to guard our hearts with all diligence you will need to guard your heart so that when the devil comes at you with thoughts you remember um, I think second Corinthians 10 from verses 3 to 6 either first or second Corinthians second Corinthians 10 where it says casting down every evil imagination that seeks to exalt itself above the knowledge of God so when those thoughts come to put down your spouse to tell you to believe the worst about uh, of your spouse that's when to fight and resist those thoughts and God will help you it's not really easy but if you lean on God for grace he will help you and, and let me just quickly add please to this if you follow how you feel you will not change how you feel you are going to need to rise up and act in faith sometimes I will be telling them I believe in you you actually do not emotionally you are saying it to remind them that look i believe in you and give them strength and an incentive to act right and also encouraging your heart to begin to restore belief mm. if you follow how you feel only <laughs> you will never trust them again never so issue statements of faith at them that also obligates them to realize that this person is not telling me, no, I tried to help you again. No. That thing you did, mm -mm, it's not a reminder. Just like that woman, go, see no more. Tell them to the face, I, I trust you. You may not be feeling like, I trust you. I know you are not going to hurt me. Praise God. Okay, thank you so much, Ma and Sir, for that response. So, our second to the last question for tonight it says, How do I handle very intrusive and controlling in laws? odd visits, boasting on our private moments, and so on and so forth. You don't handle them. Talk to your spouse. How do I deal if my spouse is becoming all my spouse is okay with it? Oh, your spouse is okay with it. Enter prayer. If your spouse is here, remember the teaching from this morning. That's the extended family. There are visa rules. Apply them. See? Where me I grew up. See, and look, I'm not trying to shift Asian landmarks. Permit me to stand. Thank God some of our mothers are there. Mommies, good evening. If girls open up on the level of abuse that uncles, cousins abuse them under their father and mother's nose, we will rethink that culture of just dumping everybody. See, I have people I'm paying their school fees. They have never slept in my house one day. I have two young girls. I realize breast is out. The other day, I mean, I was telling me this stomach page is feeling maybe it's menstrual crap. <laughs> because we got them the right books at the right age to start learning, like uh, Raquel's book, Flow, to start learning when menses can come. She's not nine. I said, ah, ah, no, ah. Do you understand? So, please, 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 when it comes to this matter, I'm, I've technically left the question. That husband needs prayer. That husband needs teaching like we did this morning to reset his brain. But you see, there's a defense you give the home front. I heard something from Apostle Femi Lazarus. True. He said, when it comes to parenting, everybody's a suspect. 
Because people who abuse people, first of all, win the trust of parents. So before I know it, casually, you're throwing your children at all man. Please, I beg you in the name. Everybody is a suspect. I'm not kidding. You see my three Nigerians with me? It's not, I, don't tell me I'm scared. I'm not scared. I must take step as a parent. Because children are also at a vulnerable age that they cannot talk. And they are giving strict warning if you tell anybody I'll kill you. So, statistically, every 10 girl you meet, eight were either violated or were at the point of it when help came. Eight. Only about two escaped it completely. I give you a very bad story. One of our friends, famous spiritual family in this country. Her mom is also a top minister. A minister came to minister for the mom. She was going back to school in the state where that minister resides. He trusted, she trusted her innocent daughter to enter car and follow minister, drop her in school for me. Uncle wanted to sleep with her. You just finished ministering for the mother. They trusted you with an innocent teenager. To just, you are going back to just drop her in school. So when it comes to that in-law matter, most times we just see it from wicked mother in law, bad mother. Hey, can, 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 that's, that's. You are talking how much access into this space are we creating that may be unhealthy? So every time they, where I grew up, oh, until my father caught it. Anybody can just arrive with their bag. It's when they are at your door, you know they are coming. I'm telling you, leaving. I, I will never forget some incidents. We we'll carry mattress to the sitting room. Several persons on mattress, male and female. Even me, I press breast. And the person was way older than me. I'm telling you, breast rub me, then I touch him. What's seven? Eh, I'm telling you. You people don't like this level of truth. <laughs> I think I was 10 or so. I checked the things. What's this? <laughs> That's the highest. I, this person was way older. I'm telling you, complete form woman. Say, please, I take God beg you. So you see this in law matter. Men here, I beg. Some stress your wife is going through. And please, I speak with every sense of I said something this morning, I didn't even complete it. With every sense of responsibility. Before my late mom died, my, mo my wife actually misses my mom more than I do. I'm telling you the truth. How mommy was doing, she was working in Kogi State Civil Service. One month to her EDD, she arrived. She doesn't leave until one month after birth. Mommy was so close to my wife. If the environment was not enabling, I would have found a way to reduce it. But she was such help. That's not what I'm, I'm not saying lots are bad people. And guess what? What I failed to say this morning. Mommy did not just pray through on us. She prayed through on the two children that she met. Throughout the night, when Julia gives birth, the child is with mommy. She comes to her door like twice. Just for Julia to breastfeed her, she takes back. And throughout that night, if you go through her door, what you hear is Malaka Soto Prata, Embrada Kapata. Every night to night to night. Julia will sleep where she will just knock, wait at the door. 10 15 minutes, you breastfeed, collect the baby back, and hear it throughout the night. Come, brother. That's not the in law I'm talking about. This is no problem. They found their relationship in a way that I couldn't even tamper with it. But you see, if the relationship is not necessary, why are you forcing it? What are you doing in my house? What I, so don't you trip yourself when me I agree up cousins say hey, hey pay school fees encourage people call them visit them discuss with them but you see some intrusion are not necessary because some people's love life is not even moving because somebody is there controlling everything ah uh, uh, this is your wife self ah uh, ah uh, this food look like burnt off friend eh uh, this one this food is sort of the head ah uh, hey please interruption then a flip side to that question. There is a flip side to that question, sir. Now, this one has to do with intruding in-laws. Now, what about the situation where the family, they stay, they live with the in-laws. So they stay in their in-laws' house. That's where they live. And the husband is not even willing to, to move, to move out. Uh, before Julia jumps in her contribution, Unfortunately, some cultures do this. We even have people we know personally that are facing this. It's, it's not God's standard. I know cultures that do this as a way of life. 
See, anything that tampers with God's order, and how do you tamper with God's order? Do you know God made things to be easy? That's why I told the man, come, leave your parents. Let me quickly say this with every sense of responsibility. There are several cultures you see in scripture. There's the culture of God, there's the Jewish culture, and there's the New Testament teaching. That's why when people argue that white wedding is Western culture, I don't argue with them, it's true. What is the New Testament culture? Is that two persons agreeing under God before an anointed minister does not Western. Whether you are wearing buba or you are wearing kaftan, once these three conditions are met, under God is New Testament marriage. But wearing white wedding is what is Western. What is the culture of God? The things God said without the culture of man. Of course, most culture of men, God himself endorsed them. Like most of Jewish culture we practice, God oversaw it and agreed. But let's go back to this in-law matter or where you live. In the very beginning, before there were tribes, before there were nations, he said for this cause, a man will leave father and leave mother and cleave to his wife. I don't see how that places you in the parameters of your father's house. Let me say this to every sense of responsibility. I think they are recording, but they are recording on their own. My biological father is a multi-millionaire. My papa will born me. I live my life on the merit. I worked with him from NYC until 2017 when I stepped out and opened my firm. Some of you know J.S. Okutepa, that lawyer whose name went around during Peter Obi for saying he's not doing with the president and he went to do it. J.S. Okutepa, now my papa, and first child, first son. See, people need to wake up and find themselves. I live my life on the merit. If I broke, I broke for me. If I'm struggling, I struggle for me. So that I can take decisions that father cannot say, sit down there. At this age, with this kind of purpose, they'll say, sit down. And you sit down, eh, full, eh, full. God forbid. <laughs> Let me repeat, first child, first son. But you see what? And that's how I have zero sense of entitlement. I have a good relationship with my dad. Let me tell you, we had our things, but we have solved it. I have a solid relationship with my father. So I'm not here telling you, rubbish your father. Uh -uh. But you see, zero sense of entitlement, full focus. If that man is here, my brother, the spirit of a full want to near you. Go back tonight and think to yourself. I have not said this a lot publicly, but I'm going to say it today. When I return from Aberdeen, I have the best in-laws in the universe. You see daddy that walked in here today, we are not expecting him. He's busy with his PhD. Daddy was controller general of prison in this country from 2012 to 2014. Height of his profession, retired honorably. Since then, he has been pursuing. He's a reverend now. He went, did theology, did masters, always the best, best. He's finishing his PhD now. I came back from Aberdeen where McCordy, we left McCordy. They housed us. I came back from Aberdeen making my own plan to move. Through me, I know the in-laws I have. They spent money and renovated a choice property in the middle of Abuja, Zone 6. Good location. It's me they used to renovate it for us to stay. I woke my wife up one night and said we're about to move. I didn't say I'm succumbing to pressure. But the nonsense I was hearing, I was not even planning to stay. But the nonsense I was hearing from the side of my family was like I was a cursed soul. It's not because of them. I, took, I already had my decision. I woke up that night. I said, we have finished the renovation. We are not staying. I just returned from my bed. I was broke. Starting, restarting my life. We had just moved to Abuja from Makodi. The difference is clear. My rent in Makodi for one year is not... <laughs> my Abuja rent... We we'll pay my rent in my country for five or six years. So we went to our mom. Our mom said she will never talk to Rusty. She dies. Of course, mommy was just talking. What? We favorite people. She did this for us. If you know how much you spent setting up that property. I look, mommy, I'm not going. Daddy called me aside. I say he cannot question my decision as a man. He supports us. Let's move. That's how our rental journey in Abuja began in 2015. So it's not when, when Moses decided not to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, uh, is it daughter and uncle sister? Yes, Pharaoh's daughter. It was a decision. So please, when you want to follow the culture of heaven, it may cost you something. I walked away from how if you know how much they passed through me to fix the house. Even me, I was weeping inside. We started our rental journey. 
God will settle us. He's taking us to the place. I mean, the things we have seen already, God is faithful. Amen. So please, I beg, I take God beg you. Don't go and eat a morsel of me that will cost you a better right. Move. God knows why. He, he said, come out from that system. For the woman involved, all I have said is what you should pray your husband into. Let this realization hit him. Let him wake up and say, you know what? Let's move. If you want to dash me house, please dash me a house as I your cup out. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. I wanted to emphasize the point he mentioned earlier. Michael about parents being custodians of their home and being vigilant about who comes around who who stays and who is always in charge of the children or who is um, around your children very key uh, you know sometimes we think because they are family as in nothing can happen i have a uh, you know friend and one of the she, she had gone through a lot in terms of abuse and it wasn't outsiders that were responsible it was family relations very close family relations and she was like if her dad knows you know what has transpired in terms of the abuse she has gone through for years she said their family will scatter so for the sake of that she she kept quiet for years and endured so much abuse and she's talking about uncles cousins people so close to her father very i know this person is talking about close very close trusted the dad had no idea that all through her growing up age they were just passing her like ping pong in fact the worst i've heard of that not the worst very terrible she said it in public so i can mention but let me just spare her name she's a popular preacher in this country she got to the point the gate man was having her they were living in bodilion in lagos well the who is who is in lagos he will carry her to the generator house and foul later please i beg you you see we are emphasizing this matter like mama said this morning you are the fruitful age you are just born children i had the next responsibility defend these children please i beg you these matters are deep don't leave wounds that will leave you some parents don't even know why their child turned back and is as terrible as they are because there are some ladies they are wrecking men today because they are offended at men men hurt them and they woke up and say you see men i will finish them some come to the point of repentance when they are confessing you'll be shocked that's how satan deceives you were violated you are not going around sleeping with men thinking you are killing men you are not killing men satan is finishing you but you see parents need to take complete responsibility for these things complete yeah you know when i was a child one time my mom brought a house help to the house and she looked all good you know everything was uh, thick and what she didn't know or what the family members didn't know that was that every night she spent she spent about two weeks in our house every night when everybody was sleeping i was trying to fight off a woman from her violating me and you know i couldn't my mom was you know like a she was a teacher so she was very military about the way she handled the the, the house and i was not i couldn't approach her to tell her this was what was happening so in the night when everybody is sleeping somebody is trying to touch me and we are fighting you know so be vigilant about who you keep around your house and if you can help it like when we had a uh, house helps earlier nobody sleeps in the same room with our children as in we just it's our children and the help is in the other room as much as you can help it please protect your children from abuse this is so important that's why i'm emphasizing this all right thank you so much Sanma. i think we will call this a wrap at this juncture we have just can we please celebrate them yes